I'll do a quick demonstration here um, with the roller. And Bob, you want to try to? Sure. Just, you can't talk. You want to have a mic. Um, Dennis is at some point today. We'll talk more about applicators, but um, you know, storage of your applicators, keeping them clean, etc. This is a uh, a welding rod case that uh, we got at our local Harbor Freight, so we know it was very inexpensive, um, and it houses the roller perfectly, and it keeps it uh, keeps it in that humid environment that we want to store these at, right? Labeled with not only the product but the the uh, sheen that we're going to use. We want to avoid mixing sheens on our products, uh, on our applicators, right? I had one of these with a DTS roller in it for three or four years. Didn't smell. Stayed. It was still, still, uh, still wet. So it, they actually work pretty well, which is surprising sometimes for Harbor Freight, right? Mm -hmm. So this applicator was rinsed out, right? Before and after every job, rinse it out really well. Then I'll go the extra step with the rollers to make sure they are just damp and really take it, you know, maybe outside in the job, not over the carpet or anything, and give it a bunch of spins and really kind of spin out or shake out uh, all, that, uh, all that moisture. All right, so when we're rolling, is the roller going to put down more or less product? More, yeah. Typically, the roller puts it down a little bit heavier. So this roller is a microfiber roller. It has uh, training wheels, we can call them, right? Not training wheels because we're four years old and don't know what we're doing. But uh, really, they're guides, right? They're, these are going to sit on the floor, and they're only going to let so much pressure go down in that, on that floor for that roller, um, almost, again, as like a, a depth gauge, right, to get that uh, just the right amount of finish on there. Um, you can remove them. They pop off, right? You'll want to remove them to clean them. Not everybody uses them when they roll, um, so that's, that's, your, uh, that's your choice. Um, but basically, the training wheel part of it is that they, they provide you kind of a visual of how much product should be going down on the floor, right? Um, so then if you did take them off, you kind of know what you're looking for. All right. So we don't really have too much to cut in uh, on this floor, but Bobby's going to going to uh, demonstrate the cut-in portion of it. But unlike where we T-barred and we cut in down the long wall and then just three feet up either side, we're actually going to cut in three or four feet down either side and perpendicular to the length of the room. Okay, And we're going to work this way. right? We're still going to roll with the grain of the wood, but we're going to work in this direction. Are you ready, Bob? Are you ready? Sure. I'm ready. So we make sure we pour a sufficient amount of material. Keep it away from the wall. If it does get close to the wall, Bob can pull it out so the puddle's not that close. Because as I roll, I want to make sure that I'm not hitting that wall, right? Or in this case, all my sanding equipment. I like to start with a little bit extra finish because I want to make sure that I season my roller so that I have just that product in it, right? So I can even roll right along this. Make sure I got that product in there. Okay, now anywhere that Bobby runs that cutting pad, I'm going to back roll over with my roller. This way I'm assured I'm going to, oh boy, I'm going to hit that trim every time. This way I'm assured I'm going to get the same film build and coverage rate. Naturally, you want to put a little bit of pressure down with the cutting pad so it might go on a little bit thinner. So we want to make sure we're matching that. So I'll pour my, pour my first line right in that wet edge. I'm not overly concerned <clears throat> with the amount of product I have as far as that puddle management we kind of talked about with the T-bar. Um, and I am going to uh, spread the, the puddle wall to wall, or board seam to board seam, etc. right? So I'll start right behind my puddle, roll back, feather forward. Always want to make sure I'm feathering out. Now, if I'm a little bit heavier up here, because this is where I started, I can just come back in and kind of clean that up. Maybe I'll, on my next pass, just go a little bit further down. 
Just like we bolt when we bold, kick out your leg. So anytime I'm placing this roller down, when I feather, that's my, that's my guide to know I gotta feather past that, right? Because otherwise, I'm gonna have a heavy spot there. So now I have to feather past that area. As you get to know how the roller is gonna, gonna function, we could also go back and actually take all this product, wet out our area, kind of like uh, Dennis was doing with the dry fast sealer. I wet out my area. Now I'm coming upon a little heavier puddle. I might pull this a little bit further down first. All right, then I can come back and feather out that area. Hold the roller underneath so we're not putting a lot of product down. Now my cutting guy is gonna come over here, start to pour, because he's gonna see that I'm nearing, nearing the edge of my, uh, of my line. When he pours, he pours right on that wet edge. Sometimes the product is difficult to see. And so by pouring right on that wet edge, we know that we're getting product right where it needs to be. Now he's cut down along this wall, so I can just follow that right along. And again, I'll start right behind my puddle. If you get, say, a heavy spot out in the middle there, I can come back, thin that out, but then I'll just feather a little bit further past it. As I run the roller from, in this case I'm going right to left, but I'm gonna do another couple passes. I always wanna have the, the um, heavy part of the yoke in the direction that I'm going, because it's gonna wanna create some weight. So it kinda creates like a feathering. So I can just real quickly hit this area. Get that feathered out. Okay, the original method again, back and forth in the same pass. Move over no more than a half a roller and roll it forward. A little quicker when you wet it out first. You just have to kind of be aware of where that product is, where you stop, and where you start. Who, uh, who, who rolls? Got a couple of rollers. Any different uh, techniques that you guys use? Yeah, we start on a roll, then hold back backwards and head, head out kind of like a tree bar. Okay. Wood. And then uh, before it puddles out from the beginning like that, we're just getting a whole line all the way back. With the grain of the wood. With the grain. Okay. Yep. Little sections and out as you go. There's not really a, a wrong way or a right way. Again, these are, you know, best practices and methods that we can use. Would you change it on a big, wide room? Big, wider room, maybe I would do half. You know, you do that dry line. Um, we, uh, we rolled, you know, that Chaparral Gymnasium that we had the photo of. Uh, we actually rolled a coat of that, and we had um, three rollers going, and we would just stagger our rolling pattern so that, uh, you know, we didn't roll somebody into a corner, and then we, were, we weren't leaving the, the finish for too long. Darren, one thing I've seen is uh, sometimes the beginner has too much material on his roller, and as you make that feather motion, mm -hmm. and, the, and the roller is spinning, and if it's chock full of material, it'll spin just as soon as you have past where you already... Yep. Yep. So the, uh, the microfiber roller will hold... Uh, I think material a little bit better than the striped roller that we had. Um, as long as we're not really, really spinning it, I'm not sure if I'm getting a lot um, there. It's kind of the, a, a f that feather technique that will help with that, um, having that, that roller saturated. If you do find you have a spot, you know, it gets trickier, but then, you know, then you have to just roll a little bit further out. Todd had mentioned kind of, you know, know your, have a game plan, 
Know your room, start for him, please. Um, and ha if the room's cut up, how are you going to work around certain things? The roller is fantastic for that. If we had an island here, I can roll this rectangle here behind the island and be done with it. Right? And then I can come here, I can roll up to that area, I can roll myself out in front of the island, and then work myself, work myself right back out of the room. Any place, again, where we, we pour right up to that edge, we have a lot more control with the roller. We're able to, to go from board to board. So if we wanted to just do this section here, we could pour it from this seam to that seam and just work that area there. T-bar, cut and pad, a little bit more difficult because you kind of are at the mercy of the puddle that you pour. Not putting any pressure on the roller, just letting it flow out. Now when I get against my wall here and I have to work out of the room, it's going to get a little bit trickier, but Bob's going to cut me in along this edge and leave me a little bit of finish. I'll still work with the grain, but I'm going to work my way out of the room this way. We chose extra mat, the most forgiving and our most well-stocked material we have in our facility. We'll call that the reason. Thanks. So now I can just pour my edge along here. I know I'm going to work out the door here. Keeping that wet edge is going to be, it's going to be key, but I'll pour a little bit along here. Now in this case, I don't really have to worry about cutting in, but thanks. If I had a wall, a true wall here, I could cut in. I don't need to cut in. I don't need to feather out with the grain because I'm going to roll right back over that, right? So I may come in, kind of wet out the area a little bit. Then I can reach back in, feather this with the grain. All right, and then maybe I can further out that area this way. I've got multiple coats on this floor, so I'm pretty confident that if I really wanted to, I can come in, I'm just going to do it this way, but I can wet out this area. And feather with, uh, against the grain. On a, uh, on a seal coat, I would probably not want to roll just because I'm going to get absorption from material into that, into that spongy wood, right? That wood's going to want to soak up that material. But here I've got a nice base layer with my sealer and my uh, last coat of finish. Last coat of finish was mega clear. Our recommendation when coating with from one product to the next would be to wait overnight, ideally 24 hours, um, and then a braid and coat. This is a wide doorway. All right. Now, let's part that again. Now, I with the roller, I may have, I may have a closet. I may have a uh, a tight area where I can't actually get that roller handle in there. So I can I can take it off, right? And I can pour out my puddle. Maybe I use the cut-in pad and 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 uh, spread the product out, and then use my roller to just kind of even it all out, right? I want to try to have a consistent match with all the other areas that I rolled. If I had, say this was carpeting and I had a header board here, I could cut in that header board. I can get right up next to it with the roller, give myself a little bit, maybe a half an inch, and kind of ease it in and roll that area out. I can even roll across that header board, get back here, roll across that header board, and then roll it out. The roller is going to put the product down in such a way that it's going to flow and level out without really concern for the direction.
Aside from the fact that it's about 95 degrees in here, um, and you're all watching me, um, I am much more comfortable rolling than T-barring. I don't have any puddle here at the end, right? I, um, I for the most part, was able to um, just go right over everything that Bobby cut in, knowing that you know, I didn't really have to worry about feathering out certain turns or anything because I was going to roll right back over it. Uh, if this was my doorway again and the wood was running the opposite direction, same thing, I could reach in behind the door, roll past it, and feather out that area, right? Any questions on rolling? Did I miss some spots? Probably. David. Correct. So the second coat was a water base, but it was Mega Clear HD. So it was a different product in the Bona uh, product lineup. So we would want to wait a minimum of overnight, 24 hours, abrade that, and then coat it with so the uh, different if you're product. Using different products, you would abrade. Correct. Yep. Um, if you're using an oil modified, ideally, you know, you wait really on all of them. Ideal, wait the full cure time. Right. That's not always going to be uh, the option. Right. Uh, especially if we're doing. You know, we're doing a coat of mega, uh, and then we're going to do two coats of traffic, right? We're not going to wait a full week for that mega to cure, right? But I would suggest waiting as long as you can, um, and definitely abrading. Now, if it's different sheens, so if we put extra mat down, right? If we decided to come in and, and um, put down gloss, then I can go right over that with gloss. And in that scenario, I probably would. You know, assuming that this looks good, um, I might not want to abrade it, right? Because I don't want to introduce swirls and scratches and then put a, a high gloss finish over top of it, okay? Holds a lot of product. We see I'm not really getting a lot of drip out of this, right? So when the homeowners are right behind me, you can sit and chat. All right. Any other roller questions? So at this point, you just wash out that roller? Or? Yep, so I would rinse this out. Um, a 5-in-1 paint tool that's got the roller curve on it works great. You can kind of get all that excess finish out of there. Rinse it out, put it in my, in my uh, container. Uh, now, one thing I didn't do that I would have done on the job is that container wouldn't be over there in the homeowner's kitchen. It would be at the door where I'm, I'm walking out, right? So when you roll, you don't put it in between the bumps? Um, again, if, so if I'm rolling the opposite direction, I want to be, be aware of what I'm, what I'm rolling, right? So if, if I'm rolling sealer, which I, I'm going to suggest not to roll sealer uh, until you're, you're well versed with the, with the roller because uh, that, that wood is, that's, it's raw, right? It's going to want to absorb that sealer, um, whether you're using a T-bar or whether you're using the roller. The roller is going to be a little bit slower by nature, and so you could, if you're not going quick enough, risk having some shadowing, right? Um, so, but you can do it, right? But I would suggest not going cross grain if, if you absolutely um, can avoid it. Uh, in this case, we had uh, here two coats of, of, of sealer, coat of finish. So we have a nice, solid, smooth build layer, right? So we're able to actually um, work that cross grain. If we had a medallion, if we had herringbone, you know, any sort of pattern, I'm not really too concerned at the direction that I'm going, right? Um, because I know this is, it's not, it's not pulling in and, and I guess, for lack of a better term, streaking like a, a, a T-bar would, right? Um, it's just kind of laying that finish out, right? So direction doesn't really matter. Uh, I'm going to be extra careful as I feather, right, to make sure where I kind of have that transition, transition edge, if I can go back and kind of go with the, with the grain I will, um, or just be a lot kind of even almost lighter on that edge, right, holding that pole underneath.